morning we're going to turn to Luke 18 if you're using the Bible that's in the chair it's uh, the page we're reading from is page 63 in the back of the Bible in the New Testament there so Luke chapter 18 starting with verse 31 I'll read through 43 Okay, verse 31. And he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all the things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. And they understood none of these things, and the saying was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. And it came about that as he was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire about what this might be. And he told them, and he told him, and they told him, excuse me, that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he had come near him, he questioned him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. When all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you again this morning. Um, it's, uh, I think, critically important that we try to follow Jesus' steps through the Lenten period as he prepares to go to the cross. The impact of that day, uh, it's something we need to be constantly reminding ourselves of throughout Lent. Uh, this particular incident took place before he mounted the colt, which would be uh, on Palm Sunday. Uh, as he was in the city of Jericho. Uh, a couple passages say he was on his way in. Some say he was on his way out. Uh, but there was actually the remnants of the old city because that's, you read about the book of Jericho, and the gee, I thought that place fell down. Yeah, it did. But uh, one of the kings uh, later on rebuilt that. So um, the scripture, I think, is very important as it starts out with Jesus talking to his 12 disciples. Now, 12 disciples obviously were right there, right there with Jesus the whole time. And as he gave them, this is actually the third warning, the third uh, advance that he had given these people, these men, saying, hey, here's where we're going. We're heading up to Jerusalem, and everything that has been, been written about me, we have talked about the prophecy uh, of what's going to happen to the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Now is the time. He will be delivered to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and they will insult him, and they will spit on him. It kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Because that's exactly what a lot of people do with Christ and his relationships and his people, is they mock them, and they insult them, and they spit on him. And then they will flog him, and then they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise from the dead. That is, without a doubt, the most joyous, the most eventful the most world, absolutely world-changing event that took place in the history of the world was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, bar none. Nothing even comes close. The disciples did not understand any of this because its meaning, its meaning was hidden from them and they didn't seem to know what he was talking about, the impact, the overall power of this entire event. So they moved on, and they headed out for Jericho. 
Now, isn't it amazing, I think you would agree with me, is how the Bible uses often very, very ordinary people to teach us sometimes the most profound spiritual lessons. In Mark chapter 10, if you are uh, familiar with the story, we know that it is repeated in two other books. It is repeated in Matthew and it is repeated in Mark. The same story about Jesus healing this blind gentleman. In Mark, he is identified by name as Bartimaeus. Now that's very unusual also, because rarely do we see Christ perform a miracle and the person is named, but this time he is. He is specified as his name is Bartimaeus. So I'm going to refer to him as Bartimaeus as we go through the rest of the story, because Mark clearly identifies him. Uh, it's a unique story, as this receiver's name is mentioned. And Christ, this takes place as Christ is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, he's on his way, as we all know, to face that hostile crowd, to face a crooked high priest, attend and be drugged through many, many what I'll call kangaroo courts on his way to the cross. And he was just a few miles from approaching Bethany and Bethphage, where he would eventually, next Sunday, mount that colt. And he would ride triumphantly into Jerusalem to the cheers of thousands as the king of the Jews. Now, this Old Testament city of Jericho, as we all remember the story in the Old Testament, it had been destroyed by the Israelites, really destroyed by God as they marched around it and all the walls fell in. But during his rule over Palestine, uh, King Herod the Great, he had actually rebuilt that city not on top of the old, about a mile south of the original city. And he had actually made it kind of like a resort for himself, uh, kind of like a winter palace where he could go. Uh, it was a popular city for, re for resorts and therefore wealthy people. And uh, it was really not too far from the Jordan River. And it was actually about 15 to 16 miles northeast of Jerusalem. So they were still a pretty good far piece from Jerusalem. And in most cities, and I would think especially in cities where there might be more well-off people, there were beggars. Beggars were very commonly seen in these towns. Uh, there were people that had all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And really, if you were not physically able to work back then, I mean, we didn't have any computer jobs, no desk jobs. Uh, it was either being able to do physical labor or it was nothing. And often you were stuck either being taken care of by your family or begging for your survival. This particular day started out like many other days. It was dark. And a man was all alone. And although he could feel that sun's warmth coming upon his face, he could not see its glow. But if he had known what was going to happen to him later on in that particular day, blind Bartimaeus would have walked with a renewed vigor as he made his way to that particular spot, his familiar spot, maybe his spot he sat at every day on the roadside. But he wasn't aware of what was going to happen. And he trudged along. He was shoved and he was pushed. And he was mocked by the crowd. He had to fight along the narrow and winding roads of Jericho. And finally, he somehow made it to his familiar spot. Someone may have led him there, but he ended up at his familiar spot. And he sat down and he began his daily routine of begging for those to walk by. So point number one is, he heard. In verse 36, it says, when he heard the crowd passing by, he asked what was happening. So he heard the crowd passing by. He asked, what does all this mean? I cannot see. Suddenly Barnabas noticed there's a, there's, a, there's a heavy crowd presence here, which is very, very unusual. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of traffic. He could sense and he could hear words of people talking. And he could sense that there was some praise and there was some joy in the hearts of the people that were passing by. There is no question that the atmosphere of this particular day had risen to an entirely different level. 
And he asked someone that was passing by, he said, what's happening? What's going on? And someone shouted back, Jesus of Nazareth, he is passing by. He had heard about Christ's miracles. Blind Bartimaeus was familiar with the teaching of this man, Jesus Christ. He had heard about what he had done, how he had healed the sick, he had raised the dead, and yes, he had even given the blind their sight. And he knew. He knew that this was his window of opportunity. So number two, he cried out. He cried out for help. In verse 38, he called out, Jesus, son of David, and that's very significant. Jesus, son of David, have mercy, have mercy on me. He knew that this man was the Messiah. He knew that he was the son of God. And he knew that this man could heal him. Jesus is here. And a cloud of hope, a, a cloud of energy actually enveloped him as the excitement of meeting the Messiah overwhelmed him. And he shouted out again, Jesus, son of God, son of David, have mercy on me. And by calling this out, the blind man knew Isaiah 9-7. Isaiah 9-7 makes it known that the Messiah would be a descendant of King David. But what did the crowd do? What did the crowd do? It sounds like maybe today, the same thing. When the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus is proclaimed in a public forum, what does the crowd often say? Be quiet. Don't talk. Keep your mouth closed. You're bothering what we're doing. Stop yelling, this old blind man. This old man, hey, we can't hear what Jesus up here is trying to say. It sounds like just exactly like we hear what's going on in our present time. Keep your mouth shut. Keep, keep your religion out of our business, out of our schools, out of our businesses. Stop preaching this so-called bigotry that causes this separation, even though it's very clearly described in the Word of God. Don't offend people. But the blind man refused. I like that. He refused. He refused to bend to the will of the crowd. Because he was not really interested in their opinions. The crowd said, don't make a fool out of yourself, old man. The king doesn't have time for you. Now, it would have been easy for the beggar to just give up. Throw his hands up and just walk away. And maybe there were other blind folks who missed their chance because they did not take the opportunity to come to Christ. They might have been afraid of the rebuke of the people and the criticism from other people. Oh, I, I can't endure that. But not Bartimaeus, because Bartimaeus was determined to see. When did you, when do we often reject the pressure to conform to conform to the world and its ways. And just do it your own way. The crowd here wanted kind of an even-tempered decorum. But Bar Bartimaeus wanted Christ's attention, and he wanted it now. And he broke a lot of rules, a lot of social rules to get it. But Bartimaeus was oblivious to their words, really didn't have much interest as to what the crowd had to say. And he shouted even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So point number three is he came. He came to Jesus. In verse 40 it says, Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't that something? Jesus, God in flesh, said to this guy in front of thousands of people, what, what do you want me to do for you? What if Jesus said that to you today? Well, how would you answer him? How would you respond to that? Because here's a great opportunity. The man that you know to be the Messiah has said to you personally, what do you want me to do for you? Well, Jesus stopped. 
Now, remember where Christ is headed throughout all of this. Remember where he is on his way to. He's just a few days, just over a week away from shame, from pain, from humiliation, and from suffering. Do you think that that suffering that was headed his way was on his mind? Absolutely do. Because remember, he was 100% man and 100% God. He knew the physical pain and suffering that was coming his way in just under two weeks. And to think that that wasn't on his mind, I think, is, is, uh, is not, not correct. But he stopped. Amongst all these things that were going on in his head, and he stopped. Because one thing I've understood about Christ is he will always stop. He will always stop, and he will listen to a needy sinner that cries out for mercy. This teaches us a lesson. Because no matter what his burden was, he never stopped being a servant. Never. Right until he passed on the cross, he never stopped being a servant. Point number four is, he asked you, what do you need? And Bartimaeus said, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now, have you ever been to a big city and had a beggar or a panhandler come up to you and, or you pass them on the street? You know, what do they always ask for? I've never had one say, well, I'm, I'm looking for salvation today. You know, can you give me the word of God and can you leave? No, I've never heard that. Of course, I haven't been around a lot of beggars and panhandlers, but usually they want one thing, which is money. They want money. What the money's for, you know, we all can guess, but uh, they usually want some material thing. They want some money to do with whatever that they would do with it. Or maybe, maybe even an article of clothing but I have never seen or heard of a beggar or a panhandler or somebody that was down on their luck looking for anything except a material blessing. But healing and mercy? Healing and mercy? Would he typically have answered this question with that answer? A typical panhandler and a beggar? I don't think so. So then why did he ask it? Why did he ask to be healed? Because he absolutely was confident that he was talking to the Messiah. That he was talking to Jesus, the Son of God. He said, have mercy, have mercy on me. He didn't line up and stand in front of the King of Kings and say, well, you know, I am a good person. And I've often went to the temple. And I've never missed a church service. And I've never hurt anyone. And I've never done anything really, really bad in this life. So if you would feel up to it, Jesus, could you possibly heal me? He didn't do any of that. Because he knew what his good works were worth, which was nothing. And he simply said, Jesus, will you have mercy on me? He didn't say, gee, based on all the wonderful things I've done, Jesus, could, could, you, could you restore my sight? Because I've been such a good person. No. He knew he wasn't a good person. And he said, Jesus, have mercy, have mercy on me, a sinner. Point number five is he received. He received that miracle. In verse 42, Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. And immediately, immediately he received that sight. What was the first thing he saw when he received that sight? What was the first thing he saw? The face of Jesus Christ. The face of Christ was the first thing that he saw. And as a result of that, and a result of that healing, he followed in verse 43, to continue, after he received his sight, he followed Jesus. You know, that's what most people that, that come to the realization of who Christ really is, is they follow him. They want to be like him. They want to learn from him. But oftentimes, we hear people that have a, a meeting or a confrontation with Jesus Christ in their life, and they don't end up following him. And we scratch our heads and say, why? Why not? I don't know why. But it often happens. But he followed. 
He wanted to say thanks. He says, he says, I feel so much better now, didn't he? And he took off to enjoy life and have all the fun that he'd been missing, didn't he? No, he didn't. He followed Jesus Christ. He gave up the ways of the world that were all new and exciting to him, and he continued to follow Christ. And finally, number seven, he did something really important. Really important is he glorified. He glorified. The mark of a true Christian, the mark of true faith in Christ, is the person who receives Christ, who receives him into their heart, and then gives the glory to God. The person who receives the healing, the person that receives the actual touch from Christ, and then gives him the glory. Oh, what a lucky duck I am to have these doctors that did all this. Yeah, they may have, but the glory goes to God. The glory goes to Christ. It doesn't go to man. No longer Bartimaeus had to sit on that roadside every day in that dirt and that dust begging from the crowd because today he joined the crowd. He became part of the crowd. And as he followed Christ, he was praising God the whole time. And his praise was often, I believe, contagious. Contagious. You ever been around joyful and courageous and brave Christians that are full of joy? They are contagious. They absolutely are. He was persistent in his request, and he received his recite. I guess the question this morning is, have you ever felt like Bartimaeus? Have you ever felt like him? Alone, in the dark, sitting by the roadside begging. As the parade of life, sometimes we feel just, you know, passes us by. Well, Christ is passing by today. Can you hear the excitement? Can you? Can you hear the excitement of those that are following him today in the 21st century? Can you feel the atmosphere has changed and it's different when the presence of Christ is among us? The question is this morning, I guess we would ask ourselves, is do you want to see? I don't know that anyone here is blind. But I think lots of people suffer from a condition I call spiritual blindness. Where Christ and Christians and all kinds of wonderful things can be happening around them and they fail to see it. They fail to see it. They fail to understand who Christ is, what Christ does, and how he can work in your life. Our eyes are closed, and I think this is the meat of this particular story. Because all these people that were following Christ, there was thousands of them. The triumphant king, boy, we're going to follow him right into Jerusalem. And we're going to keep hoping for his miracles every single day. But they were waiting for the Messiah because most of them were convinced he was going to go into Rome and he was, or I'm sorry, go into Jerusalem and he was going to run all those Roman soldiers right out of town. The king is here, the king of the Jews, the true king is here. And he's got power and he's got authority and he's going to come in here and he's going to give us our city back, our country of Jerusalem. And he's going to give that city back to us. They had no clue he was headed for death and persecution. They were convinced that this was power. And that will come. When he comes back the second time, he will come back as the conquering king. But they certainly never expected the suffering servant. Never. They followed him because what they thought he was going to do for them and their city. But that wasn't the way it went at all because they were spiritually blind. They did not realize that he was the Messiah. And I think the meat of this message is that this poor, blind beggar stood in front of this crowd of thousands of people, signifying by his blindness that this crowd, the full majority of this crowd, was spiritually blind because they didn't really realize who Christ was. Yes, he was the king of the Jews but he was the suffering servant. He will come back again as the conquering king. But they were spiritually blind to who he was. Even though the majority of the crowd could see him just fine, he called this blind man up to him, 
what is it you want me to do for you? That was, I think, for the benefit of the crowd. It certainly wasn't for Christ's benefit. He knew long ahead of time. And it certainly wasn't for Bartimaeus' benefit. It was for the crowd that was all around him. And that's the, I guess that's the question I would ask today. Is what is it do you want Christ to do for you? The first thing we should ask him to do is, Lord, take the spiritual binders, blinders off of my eyes and let me see you in your fullness. And when we can see Christ in his fullness, Palm Sunday and the Passion Week and Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and Easter morning take on a completely different look for us. Completely. It goes from a wonderful, wonderful story to piercing our hearts to realize what a man named Jesus Christ did for you. That God with skin on had a plan. He had a plan even before Adam and Eve first sinned. And that plan was to go to the cross for every single one of you. Spiritual blinders will keep that away. We've got too many distractions. Too much going on in our life. I'll worry about that someday. Well, that someday is here today. Bartimaeus had his sight restored because he was aware of his condition. He knew he was a sinner or he would not have asked for mercy. He knew where he stood. Jot down this verse of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews eleven six. 6. And if you have your Bible, you might flip there real quick. Hebrews eleven six, 6. Hebrews eleven six. 6. It's very important. It's very critical. It's very important to every single one of us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It helps us to understand, and maybe, maybe through self-examination, we can look at ourselves. Hebrews eleven six. 6, it says, And without faith, without faith, is, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. And that He rewards those that earnestly seek Him. Do you believe that? He rewards those that earnestly seek Him. Now, here's, a good, here's the next question, I guess. I'm not an English teacher, but what does earnestly mean? Okay, I'm not sure, maybe you have a different translation. This is the NIV, it says earnestly. So, here's a definition of earnestly. Earnestly means with a sincere and intense conviction. That's what earnestly means. Sincere and intense. You know, like Buckeye fans are on Saturday? Intense, like that. Intense. Serious and intense conviction. Okay, what's conviction mean? Well, a conviction is a firmly held belief. Okay, so now let's, let's look at ourselves. Let's look at ourselves. Amongst all the, because we're, we're away from the busyness of life and work and everything else, and we're focused on Christ and his message and this blind Bartimaeus that got this healing. Why did he get this healing? Because he earnestly sought God. Now, how does that set for us? Well, I'm not blind. Well, you may have other sicknesses or diseases or afflictions because I am absolutely 100% convinced that the God that healed Bartimaeus is the same God that heals today. Absolutely. Earnestly, sincere and intense conviction. That, that's some serious stuff. But would you say Bartimaeus had a serious and intense when he was willing to take on thousands of people who he couldn't even see? Shut up, old man. Keep your mouth shut. We can't hear what Jesus is saying. It didn't, didn't hinder him a bit because he knew what he wanted. Sincere and intense conviction, and that conviction was a firmly held belief. 
He was not swayed one way or the other by whatever direction the wind blows or whatever the TV tells us or whatever some crazy politician tells us. He wasn't swayed by any of that. He had his eyes focused on Christ and there was nothing that was going to take that away from him. Nothing. And he was blind. How about that? He had his spiritual eyes focused on Christ. This poor and blind beggar Poor and blind beggar. He, even this guy could see that Jesus was the Messiah. What about the religious leaders that were part of the group? You know, they, these, these men actually saw their miracles. They, they actually witnessed them. They were blinded to his identity. And they refused to recognize him as the Son of God. That's once again, I think this is the real meat of this particular story. That's why he said to this man, what is it you wanted me to do for you? Just as Bartimaeus had this opportune moment to cry out, to cry out to Christ, and then it will be gone. Christ would have been passed by. If he would have missed his opportunity, Christ would have passed right on by. And then he would have never had the chance to meet Christ face to face and see him ever again. His opportunity was gone. Today is the day. Today is the day for salvation because you may not have it tomorrow. Today you're hearing the word of God about a Savior who invites you to come to him just like he did that blind guy. Bring him to me. Jesus is passing by. And he may never pass by so closely again. He and only He is the one that has the power to open eyes that have been blinded by sin. You know, I expect that this Bartimaeus guy, he was probably a tremendous encouragement to other people. Wouldn't you say? I mean, it would be a tremendous encouragement to me. I'm encouraged every time I hear Brother Frank out there saying that that, that sore on his foot gets a little smaller every, every week. Praise the Lord. And I'm encouraged when Catherine tells us about her vision and how it's maybe stabilized and, and her journey through this particular eye condition. What a blessing. That stuff doesn't just happen. People have been praying for these people and they have seen God working by physical healing in his time. In his time. So it's a tremendous encouragement, I think, when we see Christ working in people's lives. And when newcomers ask about Christ, or new believers, uh, I can imagine the people in, the early, in this group said, hey, look, look at this Bartimaeus guy. Look, look at him. Look at him. And you know what? See what Christ, Christ gave him his visual sight back. And look at this guy. He's over here jumping up and down and praising God and giving him all the glory for what he has done for him. Isn't, do you want that? Do you want some of that? Because the story of Bartimaeus healing is a powerful example. That's a powerful example to us of how it pleases Christ for our faith to see the opportunity to grasp it and refuse to let it go. Refuse to let it go until we receive what we need from Christ. Who would have thought? Who would have thought this beggar would instantly become a giver. What can your faith help you become today? Let us pray. Father, we uh, are grateful for these stories. And it is amazing, Father, of how just common everyday people make such an incredible impact on the readers of your word. This blind beggar was about as low on the social status, the economic status that you could get. Probably not much higher than a leper. Not much value to society. But he was of tremendous value to Christ because he was a man of faith. He was a man of faith. He was a man that knew nothing that he could do was worth anything. But he had faith in a Messiah named Jesus that could open his physical eyes and his 
spiritual eyes of the group of these thousands of people and say, now I understand that this is, excuse me, this is the Christ. So Father, may, may not one leave this room this morning without realizing that you are who you say you are, that you are the Christ, and that until you went to that cross, you never stopped serving. You never stopped loving us. You never stopped caring about your people. Christ, you died for everyone, every single person. But we still need to have our spiritual eyes opened as to who you really are. And then, and then we can praise God and we can glorify you in everything that we do. Because there's not a person in this room I can't imagine that has not had some sort of blessing from you in their life. So we can always praise God always praise God. We give you the glory, Lord, for the story. We give you the glory for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he has done and continues to do for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.